came to earth, what was his main purpose? So if I ask you what this single question, what did he come to do on this earth? Establish so, his kingdom. Establish his kingdom. He did not come to open a church. He did not come to save the world. Now this is shocking, eh? Yeah. This is it is really shocking. Because the first thing that God came to do when he the, the, the first thing that God did when he created men was what? It was to establish an invisible kingdom on earth through man. So that was the entire purpose of God. It was to establish what was invisible in a visible world. Amen. Something happened. A little worm there, you know, confused Adam and Eve on what was their purpose and the meaning of their lives here on earth. So that's where sin came in. A couple of thousand years later, Christ comes to earth. To what? Reestablish. Exactly. To restore the order. So the problem of what we have right now is that when we see church and when we see uh, a, a congregation, when we see all the movements across the world, what we see is that we're all here to save the world, period. That is partially true. It is true, but it's not the entire uh, uh, purpose. What it is complete is that he came to save us through Christ in order to establish, to restore the kingdom. And that is why it is different. We see, we tend to see the church as a finality, as an end to its own mean. That's it. We open the church, that's it. But the purpose of it was more greater, much greater than that was to use us as agents of his kingdom to establish his authority and government here on earth. So that's why today I'm not talking to everybody, but I'm talking to those who think that they have been established on this earth to reign and govern upon what God has uh, delegated to you. So you are a very important person in the agenda of God. You are very important. Did you understand that? Mm -hmm. So look at the one to, s to the right or to the left and say, you are important. You are very important. Very important. So this morning, this is part of a series. I only bring the introduction. This uh, sermon this morning is just the introduction. So the teaching it comes out of a, a, a long uh, of a series called From a Church Mentality to a Kingdom Mentality or to a Government Mentality. So we, we, when we understand all that, we will see the importance that we have as child of God. So let's start. Are we ready? Mm -hmm. So before we go there, Let's turn to our Bibles to Daniel chapter 10. And I want you to read this passage with me, which is in Daniel chapter 10. I know I have, some of you have your Blackberries or iPhones, iPads. So don't be shy, use your technology. I still use paper. No, no, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Some people pray for mana. I'm praying for that God would send me an iPad. Amen. Am I allowed to pray, son? There you go. A galaxy. Whatever falls from heaven. No. Exactly. So let's go for an iPad. All right. Daniel 10. We all have it? Yeah. Beautiful. This is what the Bible says. And behold. What verse? Oh, sorry. Uh, verse 10. 10 10. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me on my knees and on the palms of my hand. And he said to me, O Daniel, a man of greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For to you I am now sent. And when, we, and when he asked, and when he had spoken this word to me, I stood trembling. 
Then said him to me, him to me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to chasten yourself before God, the words, your words were heard, and I and I am come for your words. For the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty-one days. In other words, for twenty-one days. Let's stop right there. Daniel was praying. And then that moment of prayer, from the moment that he opened his mouth, his words were heard up in heaven. Isn't that interesting? Amen. Because he was known in heaven. Not only in heaven, he was known by the enemy. Because the, from the moment that he opened his mouth, there was opposition to his prayer. Let's start right there. Do you see the importance that one man and the influence that one man can have when he is known to God? Mm -hmm. Today, I am asking you, how do you feel and how important do you think you are to God? You know, when you pray, when you ask, when you intercede, that's why today I'm talking to people of, of high importance. Because from the moment that you open your mouth, when you start to pray, you have a direct influence, not only on their spiritual, but on their physical world. And that's how important we are. Now this thought that we just read from Daniel chapter 10, when we see one man having a direct influence on the entire spiritual world, that the enemy decided to send a territorial spirit to stop the angel of God. This sounds like Star Wars. <laughs> now think about it. Darth Vader. <laughs> Darth Vader is set because Luke Skywalker decided to understand how important it is. How important Daniel's prayer was. And I want you to know that this is only an image of what you are. Of what the influence that you have as a child of God. The problem is that we see each other as less than Daniel. But let me tell you, we are more than Daniel because Daniel did not know the cross. We know the cross. We knew redemption. We know what it is to be loved by Christ. We have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. Therefore, we are as important as Daniel is. Hello. <laughs> How many of you think you are as important as Daniel? <laughs> the others, please upstate. No, just kidding. <laughs> we are as important as Daniel is. The problem is that we tend to see certain men of God like it was only for him. Okay. Now you say, Pastor Lewis, this is only in the Old Testament. What if I tell you that the exact same principle applies to all of us in the new alliance? Amen. Amen. You want me to prove it to you? Yeah. Yes. So we could come out of this place and go out and see, I am an important person in the kingdom of, of God. Amen. 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 All right. How many of you have had struggles and big problems so big that you don't know how to verbalize the pain that you're feeling? Mm -hmm. yes. You know when you're struggling and you have pain within You've cried so much and there's no more tears coming out of you. You don't know how to resolve that situation, with, whether it's a health situation, a money situation, or it's a family situation, a financial. You know that there's a period in our lives that we grieve, that we hurt, that we cry, and we don't know how to address that situation. Amen. Amen. I know we've had periods where we've become, we come to this point where we're we are in such a pain that we tend to isolate ourselves because we don't want to bother anybody else with our pain, with our suffering. So we think that by doing so, we help the other person. Because who wants to hear about my pain and my suffering? Amen? Who wants to hear about, you know, my struggles? And that is a problem with our pain and our struggles when we have opposition to the plan of God in our lives. We'll talk about a man that was so bound, he was so isolated, forsaken by his family, but Christ saw a potential in this man. 
And when he decided to help this man, there was not a single storm. There was not a single situation. There was no, there, there was not a single uh, uh, rock that he was not going to overthrow just to seek that to help this man. When God sees potential in us, he will do everything in his power to make sure that we fulfill our mission on this earth. And it's beyond just being saved. And it's beyond being just delivered. The purpose of salvation and the purpose of deliverance is for more and far much greater uh, a mission than just being saved and praising God in the church. When we understand that the purpose of God saving us and delivering us, you'll see that there is a, God sees us in a different eye. So, first thing that we'll see is that the size of your opposition announces the size of your reward. Amen. <laughs> to every David, there's a Goliath. Amen. To every David, there's a Goliath. The problem is when we see opposition, the first thing we see is the opposition. We see our end. When God sees the opposition in our life, He sees our potential to destroying that opposition. And that opposition announces our reward. The greatness of our reward. There was a man in chapter, uh, Mark chapter 5 that used to live, that lived in cemeteries. Mm. Mm -hmm. Nobody could help this man. Chains couldn't help him. He used to mutilate his body. That was the, the, the pain that he was going through. Imagine the pain of the father and the mother. What mother and what father brings to this earth a child to see that child inflicting pain to his body, living in a cemetery? Imagine the situation and the pain that the family was going through during that period when this man was isolated because of the pain he was going through. Something happened to this man. Something caused his suffering. Something caused him to be in such a pain and being bound by the devil in the way that he was. Something happened. The reality is we don't know what happened, but what we see is that Jesus was somewhere across the lake, across the sea, and something came to oppose Christ when he decided to go to the other side. Now the problem is that when we see that situation, you know, when we see Christ with the disciples in the boat and everybody starts to be afraid because, Lord, we're dying, we're going to drown, look at this. Christ has something bigger in mind. Christ had something bigger in mind than just going to the other side. When he was going to the other side, Christ knew that there was a conflict, there was a, a spiritual war going on. Because in the, in the mind of Christ, he was going to help a man. He was going to deliver a man. Because he knew the potential that was in this man. So, what happened when he decided to go and help this man? A storm was raised by the enemy. Understand that when you, un when you know who you are in God, and the potential that you have in God, storms might be, you know, they might come. They might be presented by the enemy. But the reality is that no matter the size of the storm, Christ will help you. Amen. 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 The opposition that this man, living in a cemetery, met, started when Christ decided to go and help this man. It started with a storm. Imagine that. It started with a death sentence upon the disciples. We want, to, well, Christ wants to help this man. He's surrounded by 12 very nervous fishermen. Yeah. Afraid of being on the water. Imagine that, fishermen afraid of being on the water. 
And during that period, Christ had one thing in mind, establish his kingdom on the other side of the sea. The 12 disciples did not see that. And that is sometimes we have that, we, have, we face that, that situation where we don't see beyond. We only see one thing. We only see the immediate. We see my little comfort zone, Lord, I am drowning now. But Christ was seeing beyond the pain, beyond the storm, beyond the, the, the shaking of the boat, beyond the, the, the life-threatening situation. He was seeing way beyond that because he knew that on the other side of the sea, there was a man, there was a woman that was in such a pain. But once that person was going to be delivered, something great was going to take part in the life of that man. Amen. And it was even bigger than that because it was going to be in that region. Not only in the man, but in the entire region. Amen. Amen. The greatness of the, the size of the opposition announces the size of your reward. Now, when we see that, we know that Gideon had an opposition was called the Midianites. David had a Goliath. Daniel had the prince of Persia, which is a spiritual, ter uh, uh, a territorial spirit. Elijah met 450 prophets. Imagine that. What is the name of your opposition? If I'm here, it's just to encourage you to see beyond what you're going through right now. Because what you're going through right now is just declaring the correctness of your reward. Amen. Can we praise God for that? Amen. 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 All right. Second thing. The perception of who you are determines your assignation here on earth. The perception of who you are. If you think you are only a single mom who is placed on this earth to take care of a child, that is as big as your territory will be. But if you think that you are a single mom educating a potential leader in this society, you have a greater impact. It all has to do with perception of what you are doing. You know, you can see yourself as a, a young boy who knows nothing in life. But you could see yourself as a potential businessman who will be a millionaire, a millionaire who will help to establish a kingdom in different countries. What if I tell you that right now? The rotation of the earth on its own axis ax is 1,674 kilometers per hour. So right now, hold on to your chair. <laughs> you are traveling right now at 1,600 kilometers per hour. Do you feel it? No. Look at my hair going. <laughs> do you see it? No. But do, we, do you believe it? Yes. Do you believe that we are traveling right now 1,600 kilometers per hour? You have no choice to believe it. <laughs> it's a scientific fact. We're traveling at that, you know, the rotation of the Earth. So that's pretty fast, eh? Imagine the tickets on that. No, just a <laughs> speeding ticket. The same way that we know that we are traveling at 1600, hours, uh, 1,600 kilometers per hour, the Bible says that we are sitting in the heavenly places. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that? No. If you say so, if you say yes, I don't believe you. <laughs> because I don't know what it is to be sitting in the heavenly places. Do you? We don't know what it is to travel at 1,600 kilometers per hour. We don't, right? But we are traveling at that speed. We don't know what it is to be sitting in the heavenly places with Christ 
but yet we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why is, does the Bible says, of course, and important to that, to, uh, to that uh, 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 passage, or why do we accord such an importance to that passage when it says that we are sitting in the heavenly faces? Mm -hmm. It's because it, the Bible wants us to change our mentality and the way we see ourselves. Yeah. Because what does it mean to be sitting in the heavenly places? For those who are looking for the passage, it's in Ephesians 2.6. This passage is in Ephesians 2.6. Because sitting in the heavenly places means the following. It means that you're in a position of government. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. You are in a position of government. You are sitting with the one that conquered death. You are sitting with the one that conquered the enemy at the cross. You are sitting with the one that said, all power has been given to me. Therefore, go. Amen. In other words, that authority has been given to you. That's why we can actually say we are sitting in the heavenly place with Him. That's a position of government. Amen. Amen. You see, when we watch the news, we hear about all this corruption, different levels of government, right? Amen. So we have a biased uh, perception of what government is because we think that all government is corrupt. Therefore, I do not want to be a person of government or influence. Understand this? When we see that, it is only normal that we feel kind of awkward when I say, you are a person of government. Because you don't want to be associated with corruption, right? But yet, that has nothing to do with God's, gov God's government. You are in a position of authority. Amen. Amen. Being in high places, what does it mean also? Second thing it means, it means that you see from up above, below. You have a different view of what's going on. Amen. When we see the technological advances, we see, wow, this is good. From the one that's aware of the end times, says, oh, look at that. This week, there was a... Uh, 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 news article on the CBC saying that there's a new technology, nanotechnology, which it, it's a, nanotechnology is a very, very finite, a very small technology that you're using right now, small robots to put inside your bloodstream. And from inside your bloodstream, they're going to be able to analyze your bloodstream. From there, transmit the information to a different receptor. Wow. Imagine that. You won't need to go for a blood test anymore. They'll plug something into your bloodstream, and from then on, the, the, the information, the analysis of your bloodstream, uh, of your blood, will be sent to a uh, computer. Imagine that. So we say, wow, that is good, right? Exactly. When you know about the end times, you see, wow, that is good. But we know that this means that just one step closer to the end. Mm -hmm. Why? Perception. Because when you understand the biblical agenda, for this planet, you understand that we are heading towards an eventual end. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Meanwhile, we are persons who have to establish God's kingdom. So, being aware of God's agenda and being sitting in high heavenly places, that means you have discernment. You can see what God sees. Amen. God says that he, reveal, he, he reveals his secrets to, help, to the children. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We are in a position of, uh, uh, of a privilege with God. Amen. So again, just, which brings me to my third point. Sitting in high, heavenly places means that you are a privileged person. Not everybody gets to sit in heavenly places. Not everybody gets to sit with a president. Not everybody gets to sit with a king. How many you know of you know about President Har uh, Prime Minister Harper? You know of him, right? Mm -hmm. How many of you have actually went to a Tim Hortons or Starbucks? Starbucks, just to not to to mention Tony's favorite place, with uh, Stephen Harper. Have you had a coffee with Stephen Harper? At uh, dinner. Dinner. You did? Yeah. Imagine. 
there's a difference. You see the, 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 the percentage here of people that actually sat and talked face to face with Stephen Harper? It's a great difference, eh? Just to see him, that you know what his facial expressions look like. And to just to see him from the TV, it's very different, right? Mm -hmm. Being in a privileged position and having coffee with this person and actually get to hear a different, different uh, opinions or insights from the heart directly from the man that is government, governing than simply watching him from TV and being blasted from every side. It's a different thing, right? So being in, sitting in heavenly places means to have privilege. And lastly, it means you're in a position of authority. Because from that throne, Christ governs. And we have the privilege to be sitting beside him. Do you feel that? No. I don't. I don't feel it. Praise God for those who feel things. I don't. I don't feel a thing. But I do believe it. Amen. Amen. I do believe it. <laughs> you know, I envy all those people that feel chills and feel warm and feel, you know, symptoms of the anointing. I don't. I never do. But that doesn't mean a thing because I've been witness of great things that God has Amen. done. Amen. 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 I just know the importance that we have as children of God. Amen. Okay, so. Third thing. We'll be moving on because I have too many notes. This is like I, I was saying, this is a, a long series. So, number three, to establish God's kingdom, you have to enter the occupied territory. Amen. Problem is that we like, we want to establish God's kingdom from the comfort of our living room. Not going outside, not talking to people, not meeting people, only praying. Thinking that praying for revival is gonna help. You know, I believe in revival. Don't get me wrong. I believe and don't believe in revival. I wanna explain this. I believe that, yes, a great awakening can happen, but it, does, it doesn't come but not doing a thing. Understand? Mm -hmm. Just by praying for it, it doesn't help. Sorry, I, I, I don't agree with that position. That just by praying for it, it's going to happen. No, 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 it doesn't happen that way. People have to see what God does. Amen. Christ walked in different regions and everywhere He stepped. The crowds came to Christ because Christ went to their territory. Amen. He didn't sit somewhere in Jerusalem in the synagogue and wait. Understand? Mm -hmm. See, the perception. So, in order to establish God's kingdom, you have to enter and enter an occupied territory. When Christ, and, uh, you know, went across the sea after the storm, he knew that he was there to help a man in chapter 5, Mark chapter 5. He was there to help one man. He was there to help that he was there to help this man that was bound, living in a cemetery and cutting his body. He was isolated. An isolated, an un unresolved problem. If you could write this in your, in your, take a note in your heart or in, uh, on a paper, an unresolved problem will isolate you. Amen. An unresolved problem will isolate you. There was many unresolved problems in the in the mind and in the heart of this man. In order for somebody to be living living in a in a cemetery, you have to have issues. Amen? A lot of issues. According to the Bible, at least 600 issues. Why do I say that? Because legion was normally the, uh, 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 a name given to a part of the uh, Roman army, which would uh, was a minimum of 600 men. So if legion was the problem that this, ha this man had, that means he had 600 little buddies living inside of him. So that's a lot of pain. That's a lot of trouble for him and the family. Imagine that. So in order to establish God's kingdom, Christ had to go into the occupied territory and face the problem. Now, we have to face our kings. 
We have to face our kings. Let me, let me give you an image. When in the Old Testament, God gave the instructions to Moses to establish a tent, the tabernacle, for him to come down. The tabernacle was outer, was, was outside, was something physical, right? Because the enemies were around Israel, around the 12 tribes. The enemies were all over. There were physical enemies. So they needed a physical evidence of God being there. Amen? Amen. Something happened in the New Alliance, in the New Testament. God's tabernacle dwells inside of us. Why? Because our enemies are within. Bitterness, pain, traumas, problems with sexuality, problems with money, everything is inside now. So that's why the tent was moved from outside to inside the man. Because the problem was different, was in a different place. You know that Israel, in order to conquer the promised land, had to face more to more than 30 kings and overthrow 30 kings in order to establish and to conquer the promised land. And I did a study for, and I, I, I took each name of each king and look at what it meant and what it represented. You should be surprised at what the Bible says. What Israel had to conquer in order to enter the promised land. In other words, we have things to conquer within us in order to conquer this land. Hallelujah. Do you follow me? Amen. It's okay? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes our enemies could be territorial. Like the man that was oppressed by the demon there had a spirit that lived in him that controlled the entire region. It's funny. The Bible says that the spirit dwelling in that man controlled the entire region. Now, sometimes there are territorial enemies that we carry within our bodies. Generational curse, generational diseases, generational problems. Grandfather had that problem, my father had the problem, I had the problem, my children have the same problem. Have you seen that? Don't call it a demon, but at least call it a big enemy. Call it whatever you want to call it. But it, you have to face that king. You have to overthrow that king in order for you to move to the next level. Amen? Amen. Amen. It could be family issues, financial issues. You know, the same financial situation from grandfather to father to son. Same, same problem, same addiction, same situation, over and over and over. Look at what's in your family tree and see if there's not a king that you have to overthrow. Amen. <clears throat> Which is particular that when Christ got to the other side of the sea, the enemy came running. You know, the man who was oppressed by the demon came running to Christ and immediately, immediately, the Spirit spoke to Christ and he knew who Christ was. Job chapter 1 verse 10 says that when Satan came before the throne of God, Satan knew about Job. He knew who Job was. In the New Testament, there were some men trying to cast out some, some demons, some spirits. And what did the spirit say? I know who Jesus is. I know who... Who are you? Right? In other words, we are, as children of God, so important that they know us in the spiritual world. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> Is it good for you to be known? Yes. <clears throat> Someone to hide under the chair now, eh? Yeah. I see some people turning red, purple, and blue. I want to be known. I want to be known. Because if you're known, 
that talks about the influence that you have. Amen. The importance that you have. Amen. 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 Okay. And I will want to conclude this last thought. There is no ceasefire or peace treaty within with the enemy. Amen. There is no ceasefire or peace treaty with the enemy. When, when Israel was called to conquer the promised land, there were over, let me tell you exactly the number, uh, I believe it's 31 or 33 kings that were controlling the promised land. 31, over 30 kings, let's put it that way. Over 30 kings controlling the promised land. God has given us, each one of us, a promised land. Sometimes our promised land stays in a state of illusion or in a dream somewhere far where we can never reach a promised land. And we think it's so far away because we have so many issues or unresolved problems that we think that we are never going to reach the promised land or the land that God has promised us. The reality is that for each king that you have to overthrow, there is a distinct solution, a distinct strategy. How many times did Israel have to turn around to turn around a city in order for the walls to fall down? Seven. How many times did that happen in the entire Bible? Once. You will never hear again about Israel turning around another city seven times. It was a divine strategy for one particular enemy. Amen. There was 30, more than 30 kings that they had to overthrow, and for each one, a different strategy. I'm talking to all of the situations that we face in life. All the issues, all the unresolved problems that we have hidden somewhere in there that we dare not to pronounce because we are so ashamed of what's going on inside. There is a solution. There is a divine strategy to overthrow the king that is withholding you from your divine purpose. Amen? Amen? Why am I saying that? I want to conclude with this. Imagine this. When Jesus delivered the man, this is what happened. And this is what happened with traditional church. That's why I'm not talking to a traditional church in this morning. Amen? Amen. This is what happened. The man was delivered. He was so grateful with Christ that he went up to Jesus and said, Jesus, let me be part of the 12. That's what we all want to do, right? Please, I want to be cozy around you. Amen? What happened? Jesus said, no. I didn't face a storm. I didn't face the legion you had in you for you to be cozy with me. He didn't do that. Mm -hmm. He said, now go mm -hmm. to the region of 10 cities, Decapolis, 10 cities. In other words, the entire purpose of Christ facing the storm, facing the demons, was not to save a man for him to follow him. The entire purpose from chapter 4 of Mark to chapter 4 of, uh, uh, to, through chapter 5 was to save, deliver, restore one man because the agenda, the divine agenda that God had for that single man was not to be around the disciples but what to, was to establish God's kingdom in 10 cities. Amen? It was more than just being cozy. And follow Christ. He said, no, no, no. Now that you have been delivered, now that you have been healed, now that you have been restored, go out! Amen. Amen. That is the big difference. 
what happens in our church is that we say people are saved and they stay cozy. Mm -hmm. A lot of teachings and sermons, we lay hands on them, you know, they, they're blessed. And we get to be a little bit of a spiritually obese. A bit. The entire purpose of Christ delivering one man voice for this man to establish God's kingdom in ten cities. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. The vision. When we see the Bible, we have to see way, way beyond just that he was saved. No, 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 no. He was there to restore God's kingdom in a different territory. You know? Remember when I told you in the beginning, God did not come to save us and period. God came to save us, restore us, and restore us, to send us back to his story. Amen. 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 So, we had to change our church mentality to a kingdom mentality. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So, we have seen that the size of the opposition announces the size of the reward. The perception of who we are determines uh, you're the territory that you will cover. Mm -hmm. To establish God's kingdom, you, you are here to, you have to enter the occupied territory. To establish his kingdom, you must face the enemy. And last, there is no ceasefire or peace treaty with the enemy. Amen. 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 This is an ongoing battle. But rest assured that we know who wins at the end. Okay. Amen. 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 May we stand, please. The father of the oppressed man was going through hard times. His his child was living in a cemetery, mutilating his body, isolated from the rest of society, couldn't feed himself, had to be fed. That was a critical, a, a very difficult situation for the family. The man living inside the cemetery, he was oppressed by an even called legion. In other words, there were many. So he was isolated. He had nobody to talk to. Yet, he didn't know God's divine agenda for his life. Imagine, right now you might be going through hell. You might be going through a storm. Right now you maybe are doubting of to do, or to, to make a, a decision that could, could influence the rest of your, your life. You might be going through a situation where you cry to sleep every night. Imagine, I dare say this to you, that what you're going through is only foretelling the size of your victory. Amen. 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 Imagine what you're going through is to keep you from seeing your real calling on this earth. You are more than just another member of an association. You are more than a, 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 a church member. You are more than just a, a, a husband. You are more than just a, a student. You are more than just an employee. You are much more than that. When you realize that God has a higher calling for you, mm. you have been called to establish His kingdom. Amen. 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 It starts within me. I have to overthrow the kings within inside of me. Unresolved issues that isolate me from the rest of society. In order, if once the kingdom is established within me, I can conquer the world. Amen. Amen.